Now this lecture deals with the first step in the RSA key generation for both encryption signatures and asks the questions, how do we actually pick these primes? And so the typical way is, well, how do you generate a prime? The only thing we know it's an odd number. We don't have any way to actually generate primes. The best thing we can do is we pick a random prime, uh, sorry, random odd number of the right bit length, so L of the two bits, and then ask, is this number prime? And if it's prime, we are outputting it for P and for Q, and else we go back and pick another random number. And so we're doing this a bunch of times for P, and then we're doing this a bunch of times for Q. Now, well, how do we do this? What does this mean to be a prime? How do we find out? And of course, we could try to do trial division up to square root of P, or we could try the sieve of Eratosthenes. But if we would be doing that, I mean, if we could be doing so much time that we go up to this, well, at that point, we actually figure out how to factor the number. So if we can go to so large numbers, it's a little bit smaller than the n would be, but this is essentially the same effort as going for n. So this would be a really uncomfortable level of security. So if we do this in key generation, which should be a fast process, it is something where we do expect our attacker, who has much more motivation to, to break things than we have to generate our keys, to have an easy time to break. So the topic of this lecture, primality tests and primality proofs, those will actually give an answer much, much faster, so they can actually use cryptographic sizes, uh, but they do not typically find factors. So if they say this number is composite, they will just say this, they will give you maybe a proof why it's composite, but they will not give you a proof in the form of a factor. Of course, if it's divisible by three, it is an easy way to prove that it's composite, but if it's like an RSA modulus, and you're asking it, hey, is this RSA modulus? prime or not, well, it should tell you it's composite and it should not be able to tell you here is the factor P. So a primality test is different from a primality proof. Um, so the test and proof are, well, different words obviously, but a primality test um, is correct when it outputs composite. So you might also call it a compositeness proof. Um, whereas it doesn't give a definite answer on primality. It's testing, and the output is, yep, maybe prime, and you can repeat it a bunch of times in order to increase your confidence, and increase your confidence that it actually is a prime, but it might not be a prime. So it might be because the test has exceptions, or because, well, the probability has just been working against you. On the other hand, a primality proof when it outputs prime, it is guaranteed to be correct answer. It cannot give you a definitive answer on compositeness. So if it fails, you don't know whether the number is prime or composite. And the one primality proof that we're seeing here is actually such that for several numbers, it doesn't actually work. So for several numbers, it will just say, sorry, can't tell you anything. Well, let's start with a primality test, and here's one that you have probably seen before, and in any case, we have already seen the mathematics behind it, namely Fermat's primality test. So if p is a prime, then we do know that a to the p is common to 1 mod p. That is Fermat's little theorem, and this holds for all a between 0 and p. This is something which we, for instance, used in the RSA encryption explanation of why decryption works, and it's generally, okay, there we've used it in the more general form of the Euler's theorem. Here it's really just with primes. And then, well, we can also see this as a defining properties of primes, because if you do the same with, say, module 4 or module 6, which are not prime, you will find quite a few exceptions. Now, the Fermat primality test then does the following with different choices of A. So let's assume we want to figure out P is our input. We don't know whether P is prime. We want to test whether P is prime. And so what we're doing is we pick an integer A between 1 and P. Well, don't want to pick 1 because the rest is boring for 1. So strictly larger than 1, but typically 2 is a good choice. So you're starting with the basis 2. 
you're checking whether p is co-prime to p. Now, okay, for two, that would be really embarrassing if you hadn't checked that before trying this, but even for three, yeah, you should have checked that. So if the GCD fails, then it will output at its composite number, and this is one of the atypical cases where you're actually finding an effect. So primality tests can give you effect, but it typically will just tell you, oh, it's composite. So for instance, if the this test here that it would be holding for any prime, then the h to the p minus 1 is common to 1. If that fails to be correct, then you know that p is not a prime, p must be composite. You don't know anything about the factors of p, but you know, well, it is not prime. And that's already the end. So if you've done step one, step two, then you will say, well, it's probably a prime. And that is a, well, begin rather low probability. And of course, you can repeat this with more and more bases, more and more choices of A uh, to gain more confidence, but you will not get a guarantee that this is. And most numbers will get caught after a few runs of a mass primality test. So there's like, when you ask Sage for a prime, uh, for, for checking that something is prime, you can either say you want proofs or you can say that you can turn the proofs off and then it will run a bunch of these primality tests and then just say, well, probably is good enough for you. The mass tests actually have some exceptions. So there's a family called Carmichael numbers and that is a whole class of exceptions and these are the numbers for which all these are composite numbers or another type of this should be n. So these are composite numbers n so that a to the n minus 1 is common to 1 mod n. For every a between 0 and n that has GCD of a and n b1. Well, it's a composite number, so there are some divisors between, well, less than n. Um, so for those, the GCD is not 1. But for all of the ones, okay, here should be equal to 1, uh, where the GCD of a and n is 1 then also the a to the n minus 1, the a to the n minus 1 is common to 1, 1 n. So they would get caught in the first step, but well, you really would have a trial factorization there. So that is a much, much longer procedure to find this. So Fermat is a good, nice first test, but it's not actually the test we'd like to use because it has these exceptional cases. I mean, you can look at Carmichael numbers, the, la the first canonical kind of number is 600 something, so these are not too frequent, but it could help. What I actually want to go through is two slides on the Raven primality test, and this one does not have an exception. So this is a good motivation to, to pay attention. So um, here's another property. If p is a prime, then the equation that a squared is common to 1 of p has exactly two solutions. Well, you know two solutions, namely plus and minus one, and monitor prime, these are all solutions. Now, you can prove this in different ways. For instance, if you know that when you're taking polynomials over a field, that the number of roots, countless multiplicity, is equal to the degree. If you're doing this over a ring, this is not true, but over a field, this is true. So you're taking the polynomial x squared minus one, or p, and, well, it has degree two, so there should be two solutions, and here they are, plus minus one. But if you're looking at the same thing for, say, an RSA modulus, which is p times q, then you can have the following situation. And I'm writing this in the Chinese remainder theorem version because this makes really clear where these numbers come from, what is happening. So if you have a number a, so that it's common to one modulo p and minus one modulo q. Now this when you combine those numbers, will not end up with being plus or minus 1 mod n, because, well, plus 1 mod n would have both of them be plus 1, and minus 1 mod n would have both of them be minus 1. And CRT says there's a unique match between integers mod n and these systems of equations. So this describes some a which is not plus or minus 1 mod n, and, well, if you square each of these, these are 1 a squared is 1 mod p, a squared is 1 mod q. So when you combine the squares, you do get that a squared is common to 1 mod n using the Chinese remainder theorem. So 
for composite number, you have more solutions to the equation that a square is common to 1 by p. For instance, well, favorite composite number is 15, so 3 times 5. And then you're looking at 4 squared. 4 squared is 16, which is common to 1 mod 15. Um, 4 is definitely not plus or minus 1. And, well, this is exactly this example. 4 is common to 1 mod 3 and minus 1 mod 5. So if you have two factors, then you having 4 square roots of plus minus uh, of 1, of which 2 are plus minus 1, and 2 are different. So in this case, for instance, plus minus 4. If you have more factors, well, when you see in your CRT equation that you're having more signs, so you're having three parameters, or three primes, you're having three different ways of choosing these uh, signs independently, so you're getting 2 to the 3, 8 different square roots of 1, of which 2 are plus minus 1, the other 6 are other numbers. And so, at most, one half of all a's with a square b1 are plus or minus 1, if n is composite. And so the Miller-Rabin test turns this thing into a test. But we're facing a difficulty first. I mean, we cannot compute square roots. If you give me an a square congruent to 1, what p, how am I supposed to find a? Actually, you can prove that if you can compute square roots, you can factor. So, no, that is not the way to, do, to go. But we know something else. Well, our p is an odd number, and we know that we can compute a to the p minus 1 over 2 with just an exponentiation. So, well, p, is, p minus 1 is odd, so p minus 1 over 2 is an integer, so this is just an exponentiation. And since we know that a to the p minus 1, not over 2, is congruent to plus 1 mod p, well, these are square roots of it. So for prime p, when we compute this number, it must be plus or minus 1 mod p. Now, if it's plus 1, then we're still hunting for square roots. So we could try to go for p minus 1 over 4, p minus 1 over 8, etc. But this requires that p minus 1 is divisible by 4 and by 8, etc. So let's formalize this. Let's write our p minus 1 as sum s to the t, uh, 2 to the s. <laughs> Today is a day of typos. There's a times t missing. So writing our p minus 1 as 2 to the s times t. And the t is chosen so that it's an odd number. So the maximum power of 2 is, is 2 to the s. And so the maximum division that I can do is p minus 1 over 2 to the s. So that is still an integer, and so I can compute this exponentiation. So this is a to some integer power, and so, well, I can see whether this is plus or minus 1. And so this is actually how the Miller-Rabin test starts. So we're splitting our p minus 1 in, again, copy and paste, 2 to the s times t, where t is odd, and then we're doing the following steps. We're picking a random base, similar to how in Fermat we picked A here called B, but uh, between 1 and P. We're computing B to the T. So that is the odd part. Now, if this C is already plus or minus 1, then we're outputting already now. That is probably a prime. Because, well, that means in the next step we're going to get plus 1, and so we have only seen plus minus 1 squared to plus 1, which is perfectly consistent with p being a prime. Okay, so now we want to enter, we would like to do the square roots, but we're now going to do these steps in reverse, so we're going to do repeated squares until we get to s, uh, p to the p minus 1 over 2 mod p. Okay, so we're now increasing our counter from 1 to the s minus 1, so actually one less um, than the end of this loop, sorry, than the, the exponent here. And in each step we're going to square our c. I didn't want to write c equals c squared. I mean, I'm doing this in code because that works, but I don't like doing this in pseudocode, so I'm using the, the arrow to indicate an assignment. Um, 
And now, if we have reached 1, well, in the previous step, if we had reached plus or minus 1, then we had already exited. So we didn't have plus 1 or minus 1, and we have now squared, and we got 1. So we have now found a nice exception. This is not a comp this is not a prime number because we have seen or previous C is something which squares to one without being plus or minus one itself. So four or two can output composite. If it's minus one, well that is again consistent with P being a prime, and so we output it's probably prime. Okay, so now we have dealt with in this round with plus or minus one, so we're increasing our counter and we're squaring again. And again, we're in a situation that if it had been plus or minus one, we would have already exited. So if we now encounter a plus one, we encounter plus one without having gone through minus one. So this is not a prime. Okay, so we run through this until we reach uh, S minus one. And so we've now computed almost to the power P minus one. We've actually computed to the power P minus one over two. Okay, so if p is a prime, we should have seen a minus 1. Or, well, another way that this could fail is that we see that we don't even get to plus 1, but then p doesn't pass the Fermat test. So at this point, we have reached a case where we output composite because it's either won't pass the Fermat test with base b, or we see a 1, so it passes the Fermat test, without having run through minus one. Okay, so that's the miller raven primality test. And so I said before that if you have a composite number, then there's a one half chance of a number being e, not plus minus one squared one. And so, well, this might be your c here. You have, for instance, for three factors, you would have six c's that would run into here and only two would run into the minus case, plus one case, and so you're having at least a chance of one half um, of passing is probable if it's a composite. So if it's a composite, then it's less than one half chance of surviving this, and so you iterate this k times, and you're getting to a chance of less than two to the one over k, uh, to the one over two to the k, uh, to pass as probable. So this test you can just iterate and you have a very clear answer of what it means to be probable prime. So after k steps, it is, uh, if it hasn't failed yet, it is 1 minus 1 over 2 to the k likely to be a prime. That is not a proof, this is just increasing likelihood of being prime. Now what do you do if you actually want to prove primality? So I'm going to show you one test, which is called Pocklington's test. Um, you already see in the blue notes, there is a criterion that fails for some p. So this does not work for all primes. So there are primes where you just cannot use this primality. But if there exists integers or positive integers a and q with the following properties. So q must be a prime. q must be a divisor of p minus 1. Okay, we need to be able to factor p minus 1, but while p minus 1 is a more generic number, it's more likely to be factorable. Um, and we also require, and this is the restrictive criterion, that q is larger than the square root of p minus 1. And so we're going to see an example where this just fails. So for several primes, p, you don't actually have any prime factor q that is this large. There's a generalization of Pocklin, which can deal with this, but we only do this restrictive version. Now, if we compute a to the p minus 1, then from us, the theorem says this must be congruent to 1 mod p uh, if p is a prime. And so, okay, we're doing this test. So if we have a basis a for which this holds, and then here comes a combination of a and q. If we take this a to the power p minus 1 over q, and then minus 1 and compute the GCD with p. Then, well, if this is 
1, then your output is prime. Now, if it's larger than 1, then, well, if it's larger than 1 and not p, then we get a factor of p. So that's another case where we might actually get a factor, but this is an unusual case. The other way that this can go wrong is, okay, we know that a to the p minus 1 is 1 already. How about the case that it's already 1 if this is divided by q? This is similar to the steps in the Larabian, where we might encounter a plus 1 much, much earlier. So you also might encounter a 1 here, and then we have 1 minus 1 being 0, and the GCD of 0 is p, it's just p. So if the GCD is between 1 and p, well, then we score a factor. If it's p, then we have to try a different a. So you have to get lucky, or you have to be you have to have a number for which it just works on the queue, and then you have to try a bunch of numbers until you find one for which this works. Now I'm doing a small example, so it's easy to find those numbers. So let me take the prime 103. 102, so p minus 1 is easy to factor. It's 2 times 51. 51, okay, that's 3 times 17. And 17 is large enough. 17 looks prime to me, and 17 is larger than the square root of 103, so that's 10 point something, uh, minus 1, so 9.142. So we satisfy the criteria in this first item. And then we're looking for some base A. And I'm picking 2. And I got lucky at 2 already, so that was fine. So now I'm computing 2 to the 102, and that is congruent to 1, not 103. So that's fine because, well, the Fermat test again, if you have something which you would have, or when you get to doing the public informality test, you would have done a bunch of Fermat tests already. So you're unlikely to fail here. This is the part where things may fail. So we're now taking 2 to the 103 minus 1, so 2 divided by 17, so that's 2 to the 6, that minus 1, and then the GCD with 103. So 2 to the 6 is 64, minus 1 is 63. Okay, 63 is not 0, so that's good. And so 63 and 103 really have GCD 1. Okay, so we have now proven, well, what have we proved? We have proven that 103 is prime if 17 is prime. So Pockling gives you a sequence of numbers. It doesn't give you an absolute proof. It says this is prime if that is prime. 103 is prime if 17 is prime. Now we look at 17. Well, 17 minus 1 is 2 to the 4. And 2 to the 4, well, there is just no prime factor which is larger than, well, the square root of 17 is 4 point something, minus 1 is 3 point something, 2 is too small. So we cannot use Pocklink to prove formality of 17. Now, of course, 17 is a lot smaller, it's just slightly above the square root of 103, and so it's, well, in general with Pocklink, it is at least half a bit length, else this first criterion here would not hold, but it's typically not much larger, at least we can hope for that. And so we do get a chain of numbers which gets smaller. Now, in this particular case, 17 it's not so hard to run through all the numbers up to the square root of 17 and show that no, none of them divides it, so by exhaustive search, 17 is prime. Of course, also for 103, that would have been fine. Uh, these are teaching examples. Normally, we would have much, much longer chain until we get to something like this. Um, as I said, there are generalizations of it. So there are generalizations which would allow you to prove something for 17 as well. So first of all, um, there's something which does work for more than one factor, but then statements get more complicated. And there's a more general thing, which is called elliptic curve primality proofs, which is using, well, we're not going to go into the details, but we're going to see the elliptic curve uh, factorization method. And then I'll just wave my hands at that point and say ECPP is using some features which are similar to this. The main thing is that we work, instead of working with the group of integers one p, you're working on the curve model p, and then we use, instead of that the group has p minus 1 elements, we use that the curve 
there's something around p plus one but with some number next to it uh, elements and you can hope to find a prime in that factor anyway that's it on the primality proofs and primality tests unit uh, so now we know what's happening when rsa is generating prices